in Jesus' name. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your will. And we thank you for your way. Father, anoint the ground in my heart. Father, anoint this word to seed. Father, anoint the sower. Father, anoint the sowers. Hide them in the gift that you've given to your body so that we will receive a life changing, destiny accelerating, revelation of you through your word, by your spirit, under your anointing. We pray expecting in Jesus' name, amen. And amen. Give God a great big hand clap for praise. Hallelujah. This is the day the Lord has made. Amen. We choose to rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. How many of y'all are glad about today? Amen. It's a good day. It's a great day, actually. This morning, I have to tell you, as we get started and go into the lesson again, we're new lesson starting next week. Today is a standalone lesson. I did it about three weeks ago, four weeks ago, uh, how to get beyond where you are now. This will be part two of how to get beyond where you are now. We, we called it what? Moving beyond, moving beyond. And so today is part two, moving beyond, repositioning yourself for breakthrough. Uh, it's a matter of the heart. You know, um, Mika Teresa talked about how significant Wednesday night was. Well, it was so significant, Deacon Teresa, that I asked um, Pastor Chloe to share this morning a portion of that, and then we're going to segue into uh, what, what God has for us after. Amen? Amen. So if you have your Bibles, turn them to Psalm 55. Amen. Psalm 55, verses 16 through 18. Then we're going to skip down to verse 22. Psalm 55. Verses 16 through 18, then we're going to skip down to verse 22. I'm going to read it in the voice and the expanded Bible. When you have Psalm 55, say, got it. Got it. You need some more time, say, hold up. Hold up. <laughs> we'll wait for you. Psalm 55, verses 16 through 18, we're going to skip down to verse 22. If you got it, say, got it. Got it. That feels so much better. I'm going to read it from the voice. It says, But I, I shall call upon you, God, and by his word the eternal shall save me. Evening, morning, and noon, I will plead, I will grumble and moan before him until he hears my voice. And he will rescue my soul untouched, plucked safely from the battle, despite the many who are warring against me. Cast your troubles upon the eternal. His care is unceasing. He will not allow his righteous to be shaken. I want you to take a piece of paper out. If you have a notebook, I want you to get a piece of paper if you're just taking your notes on your phone. I want you to start a new note on your phone. What you're going to write or what you're going to put on your phone is, so pause for a second. How many of you remember when we wrote down things we were believing th uh, for on the breakthrough sticks? And you left half a stick up here. Okay, but of the hands that are up, I want you to leave your hands up. If you are still in faith and believing God for that breakthrough, meaning it has not happened yet, keep your hand up. For all of you that's hands are raised, that is what I want you to write down on that piece of paper or in that notepad. For those of you whose hands are not raised, I want you to write down something that you're believing God to do by the end of this month. This is not something that you can do on your own. This is something that if God doesn't come through, it's not going to happen. This is something you're believing God to do, not you're believing yourself to do. So you're going to write that down on your piece of note, uh, piece of note paper, or you're going to put it in your phone, in your notes. Put it in a separate note section, not where you're writing your church notes. And then I want you to just go ahead and go back to your church notes once you've written it. If you're putting it on a notebook, I want you to fold it up and I want you to put it, on your uh, and put it in your pocket. I want it on your person. So not in your purse, not in your wallet, on your person. So like on a pocket. If you don't have any pockets, sit on it. Put it in your hand? <laughs> no, because then they can't do anything with their hands. Oh, that's true. You might need to talk. While you're doing that, I'm going to read Psalm 55, verses 16 through 18 and verse 22 in the expanded Bible. It says, But I will call to God for help, and the Lord will save me and give me victory. Morning, noon, and night, I am troubled and I'm upset. I sigh and I moan, but he will listen to me. He will hear my voice. Many are against me, but he keeps me safe. He redeems me, he ransoms me, and he gives me peace in the battle. Give or cast or throw your worries, your burdens, and that which God has not given to you to the Lord. And he will take care of you. He will sustain you. He will never let the good, righteous people be down or to be moved. You fold it up? Is it in your pocket? It's not in your purse or your wallet? If it's in your phone, you went back to your, your, your notes, your regular notes notes? Yes, I like, I'm looking for like nodding heads. If you did it, give me a thumbs up. Just like shoot it at me. Oh, cool. Awesome. So, did you have something to say? Mm, okay. Oh, okay, cool. So, give you a little bit of, of, of background. We're going to break this down. So Psalm 55 was written at a very um, important time in David's life and during a turning point in his life. Um, in this 
passage of scripture, if you read all of Psalm 55, if you have not read all of Psalm 55, you definitely should do that. In all of Psalm 55, we see that David prays that God would manifest his favor to him. How many could use a little bit more of God's favor in their life? Amen? That should be everybody. Uh, David prays that God would manifest his favor to him, and then he begins to share his fears with God. So after he begins praying and he tells God, hey, I need more of your favor, I need you to show up and to, do, to, to uh, alter some situations for me, he then shares with him his fears. So after he asks God for favor, he says, God, I'm afraid. And I'm afraid, and these are the people that I'm afraid of. And after he does that, he begins to talk about his enemies. So he goes from asking God for favor, telling God he's afraid, being honest with God, I am afraid. Then he says, here's who I'm afraid of. Here's what I'm afraid of. Here's what I'm afraid of happening. And then afterwards, after he's done all that, and he's aimed his prayers outward and at God, he begins to intercede on his own behalf. And he begins to talk to God, uh, talk to himself, I'm sorry, and to tell himself that things are going to be okay. He begins to tell himself that, in, that God in due time was going to show up. That when God showed up, it was going to be time. He just had to wait till it was time. So he goes from asking God for favor, mm -hmm. telling God that he's afraid, talking to God about the thing that he's afraid of, whether it be a person, a situation, a way of thinking, and then he begins to talk to himself and to tell himself that God, in due time, say in due time, in due time, in due time was going to do what he said that he was going to do, and then he comforts himself in the hope of it. So it hasn't happened yet. Remember, he just finished asking God for favor, saying he was afraid, talking about what he was afraid of, and then comforting, I mean, and then talking to himself and telling himself that he was going to trust God and know that God was going to take care of it. Then he comforts himself in the hope of it. He comforts himself. He rejoices in it. He celebrates in the hope of it happening. That's expectation. His expectation goes to a new level because of what he's just done. Because he asked God for favor. Then he was honest with himself and with God in the fact that he was afraid. And then he didn't let it stop there. He identified what was causing him to be afraid. Shared that with God. And then began to tell himself that he was going to be okay because God in due time, say in due time, in due time. was going to take care of it. Once he knew that, he began to rejoice in the hope of God coming through. God hadn't even done it yet right. and prior to him praying, he was afraid. He wasn't sure. He was not rejoicing. He was not excited about the thought of God coming through because he couldn't even fathom it. But by the end of this, after he's gone through these steps, he's excited and he's in rejoicing in the hope of God coming. Say, in the hope. In the hope. So in due time, God comes and in the hope of this due time happening, he's rejoicing in the thought of God showing up. So, you know, it's the thought. It's, it's a thought. thought. So nothing had even happened yet. Nothing happened. He just, just finished the writing the, th the psalm. He, had, he just got to the last sentence and he was excited. Yeah. I just think, I mean, you think about that, just think excitement, rejoicing at the thought. Yeah. Just the thought of what God's going to do. He didn't even do it yet. Just the fact that you're thinking about the fact that he can. Right. And that he will. I just think that's so funny. Oh yeah, we say it all the time. I don't know how it's going to happen. But, but I'm, I'm excited. excited. Yeah. <laughs> we say it all the time in our house. We don't know how it's going to happen. I have no idea how we it's going to happen. But I'm excited. But I'm so excited. We walk around excited all the time. <laughs> Y'all hear me say it every time I come here. I'm so excited. Yeah. That's why. It's at the hope. Right. Amen. So let's, let's do a little backstory, Okay. So you know. So this psalm is written, like I said, David's at a really a turning point in his life. So we're not just going to look at David for a moment. We're going to look at the whole house of David and kind of what's going on. And if you really begin to look at the whole house, it's like you're watching a reality TV show. It's like the real kings of yeah. the city of David. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So we're, we're kind of looking at this reality TV show. And if you, you don't really know what happened with David's family, you're in for a treat this morning. So David, we're looking at three of his children, well, four of his children. Okay. So he's got four kids that we're talking about right now. Solomon. Absalom, Tamar, and Amnon, okay? Amnon sees Tamar, his half-sister. He becomes sick with desire for her and decides he wants her. He, gets, uh, he tricks his brother Absalom into raping his sister Tamar. So then he takes advantage of her. Absalom gets upset, kills Amnon, flees the city. His father gets upset. Nobody deals with the fact that Tamar has been taken advantage of. Um, and now Amnon's dead. David's upset. Absalom comes back, decides he wants to kill his dad, sleeps with all of his dad's wives on the roof of their house. His dad's fled. His dad wants to know what's going on, and he's talking to God. Boom, Psalm 55. Right. That's, Yikes, that's... right? <laughs> and we were like, oh my God, Walmart's got a long line today. <laughs> <laughs> and here David is. His kids are just running around, just ruining everything. <laughs> so David's in the middle of a lot. <laughs> he's a lot, and the enemy that he's talking about in Psalm 55 is his son. 
It's his son. Right. His son's made the decision that he mm. wants to be king because he knows Solomon is going to be king because God told David that Solomon is now going to be king. Now Absalom wants to be king, so he's like, ah, oh, no. He's already at the point of no return. So he's begun to make decisions that he doesn't need to make. So like I said, there's, there's all this betrayal happening. There's unforgiveness happening. There's, there's um, unrepentant hearts. Mm. There's, there's unresolved situations. Mm -hmm. um, there's healing that needs to take place. And it's all happening all at this one moment. And now David is outside of the city. And that's how Psalm 55 comes into fruition. And when you look at this house, when you look at the house of David, when you don't just look at David, but you look at his children and what's going on, you see a lot of hearts. You see a lot of unforgiving hearts. You see a lot of hearts that, that are broken. You see a lot of hearts that are unrepentant. You see a lot of hearts. But we know that what is David known for? He's a heart after God. David had a heart that was after God. David had a pure heart. David had a heart that was after God. What about his kids, though? Look at the whole family. So now we have this comparison, this, mm -hmm. this contrast between a heart that's after God and all of these other hearts. And, and like Pastor Sheree said, we talked about this this past Wednesday because this is what we're discussing right now for Word 52. But you can't help but look and to see a heart at rest and a restless heart. That's good. Because Say it again. a heart at rest mm -hmm. and a restless heart. Okay. And it's interesting because God comes to David at one point and he says, listen, your hands are, are, are kind of bloody. They're too bloody for you to build the temple. During that time frame, only priests or kings took, could build the temple. But David had already labeled himself as a warrior king. You know, there are priest kings, but he was a warrior king. His hands were too bloody, not just from the battles that God sent him on, but from the blood that he had put on his own hands through the things that he had done. Right. So God tells him, hey, listen, I know I told you that you were going to build me the temple, and I know that you started it, the ark is in the city, you guys are already working on it, but you're not going to be the one that finishes it. Right. Solomon is, and David's fine with that. David's cool. David's like, okay, awesome. His heart is at rest. Right. He's okay. He's okay with the decisions that he's made. Even though they're wrong, they're in the past. God has forgiven him for them. He's moved forward. He's not that person anymore. He's at rest. His heart is at rest. But Absalom, mm -hmm. right. not Absalom. The moment something happens, it didn't even directly happen to him, happened right. in his vicinity, his heart turns. Right. His heart turns. He's now seen evil in the world and his heart turned. Then he decided he wanted to be king. His heart repositioned itself again. And you see all of these restless hearts. Because of Absalom's restless heart, uh, Amnon has a restless heart. Because of Amnon's restless heart, Tamar has a restless heart. All of these hearts are now uneasy. They're not at rest. You know, restless means unable to relax or unable to rest as a result of anxiety or boredom, which just means it's non-active. Right. Mm -hmm. Heart is the central or innermost part of something, the center, the hub, the core, the eye. So a, a restless heart, are you unable to relax when you're waiting for God's promises? Are you unable to just kind of settle in the fact that he told you that he was going to bring something to pass? Or are you getting a little restless? Good. Is your heart moving a little bit too much because of what you've seen or what's happen happening to you? Do you have a restless heart? So we're going to find that out today. Mm -hmm. We're going to take a little quiz. See if we have a restless heart. Have I attempted to count the innumerable? Turn your Bibles to 1 Chronicles 27. 1 Chronicles 27 verses 23 through 24. I have it on my watch. 1 Chronicles 27 verses 23 through 24. I'm going to read it in the voice. It says, When David conducted the census, he did not count anyone 20 years of age and younger because the Eternal had said he would make the population of Israel innumerable like the stars of heaven. Joab intended to count them, but he did not finish. It was because Joab attempted to count the innumerable that God was angry at Israel and punished them. So right here we see that David decided he was going to have a census, so he's going to take a count for who was in the city. His friend Joab, who's also like his counsel, tells him, hey, you shouldn't do this. David does it anyways. God punishes him. Oh, why would God punish someone for taking a sentence? Well, I'll tell you why. It says right here that God gave David a promise that he would make Israel innumerable like the stars of heaven. And then David attempted to count the innumerable, so he was punished. Have you attempted to count the innumerable? That's good. Has God given you a promise, and now you go back trying to dot all of God's I's and cross all his T's? God told you that he was going to give you a promotion, so you call your boss to make sure they know your name. That's good. You just want to make sure that when the promotion comes up that they know the right name to put there to put in for the promotion. Yeah. God told you he's going to help you get to the school so then you call admissions to make sure that everything is lined up when God told you he was going to get you there. So I need to do this. I got to do this. Well, the admissions deadline is closed. God told you he was going to bring you a spouse so you walk through every Target and mall that you can find trying to look for that person. <laughs> Are you attempting to count the innumerable? Are you trying to go back Come through on. and make sure that God's doing what he told you he was going to do? Have you attempted 
tempted to count the innumerable. Because if you have, I'm here to tell you, you might have a restless heart. The promises that you've been waiting for God to bring to pass, you might be getting in the middle of. Right. You might be what's, what God is waiting on to get something done. You might be a little bit restless. Are we working for the advancement of God's kingdom? You know, when God tells David, you're not going to be the one to build the temple, David was like, all right, cool. Mm -hmm. He was fine. He was okay with that. But that's because it was about the advancement of the kingdom. Throughout David's life, we see what consistent devotion to God looks like. And even though David knows he won't see the temple with his own eyes, he's no less committed to doing God's work. You know, he could have walked outside of the palace and said, Hey guys, I'm not building the kingdom. You can stop now and continue to move. But he didn't. And because of that, David taught his people and he taught us to advance the kingdom at all costs. We see throughout David's life that we must work for the advancement of the kingdom because that's what God desires. You know, if we realized that our 8 to 5 was about advancing the kingdom, we'd get promoted more often. Come on. If we realized that the kingdom needs more increase, so I have to increase because the kingdom needs it, we'd have more money in the bank. If we called to money for the kingdom, we'd call to more money for ourselves. We would naturally get more money because the kingdom needs more money. You know, when we, when it's a proven fact, when we assess the kingdom and where there's a need and mm -hmm. we tell God, I'll meet that need, you get increase. Yeah. Because now you have to be fit for the job that you yeah. need to do over here. Yeah. So why, don't, why not find a need in the kingdom? You know, I have a strong affinity for this. Lord, help me do this. You'll increase. Yeah. The Bible says that the wealth of the wicked is laid up for who? Yes. Who are you? Righteous. So increase belongs to you. Amen. So when you go to work at 9 o'clock, when you're supposed to be there at 8, are you advancing your kingdom or God's kingdom? <laughs> <laughs> Whose kingdom are you advancing? Mm -hmm. We're supposed to advance at God's kingdom at all costs, but God told me he was gonna start a biz I was going to start a business, so I'm not working for myself right now. I'm working for somebody else. Well, you need increase to start that business, right? Mm -hmm. So you need to continue because regardless, you're working for God's kingdom and not yours. If you're not working for the advancement of God's kingdom, you're working for the advancement of your own. And if you're working for the advancement of your own kingdom, I have something to tell obligated. you. He's not obligated to help you. And that's a symptom of a restless heart. Yes. Am I content with my purpose or my calling? You know, again, David wasn't upset about not being able to build the temple. He was happy with being the warrior king that he was. Sometimes I think we get a little bit frustrated mm -hmm. because perfect will doesn't look the way that we thought it was going to look in the beginning. Perfect will looks like this, and then our decisions cause us to kind of go like this. Then God calls us on the phone and says, hey, plans change. His plan didn't change, but our plan changed, and we get frustrated because of the choices that we made. Mm -hmm. Are you content with who you are, your purpose, your calling, and how that's going to look? And are you okay? If a promise that God made you, he says, hey, look, you're going to get all the plans laid for this business, but your grandson's going to do it. Good. Are you mad? David wasn't upset. No. And I'm here to tell you right now, if you're a little frustrated with where you are and what God has called you to do, you have a symptom of a restless heart. Mm -hmm. yeah. You're not at rest. You can't have a heart after God and be upset with who he's called you to be. Oh. There's time. There's time for more. You don't know what's going to happen three years from now. But right now, what are you called to do? Who are you called to be? Where are you called to be going? Are you the unrestored? Hmm. You know, Tamar was never restored. That we, know After that, that we know of. After that situation happened, Absalom tells her, basically, go away. He was so angry at what had happened, he didn't even care for her. Mm -hmm. right. Am I walking around leaving other people unrestored? Yeah. Am I unrestored? Or have situations happened in my life? Have things, have traumas mm -hmm. taken place that someone told me were illegitimate? And so I never received healing. Or have I walked around other people when they were broken and they were hurting and I told them it didn't matter, it wasn't a big deal, you just need to keep moving? Come on, teach. Am I the unrestored? Have I been walking around leaving other people unrestored? If you have, or if you are that person, I'm here to tell you, you have a symptom of a restless heart. God doesn't want fragmented individuals walking around. He wants the fragmented to become whole. Amen. So that they can do the work of the kingdom and they can advance. So if you are fragmented, you the symptom of a restless heart, but God. But God. But God. Last but not least, am I sick with desire for something God has not promised? You know, Amnon was sick yeah. for Tamar, his half-sister. And we think about it really high, like, oh my God, that's disgusting. I would never, you know, think about a relative that way. But let's just make it a lot simpler. He was sick with something that in no way did he have a claim or a right to. God did not tell him that he was supposed to have that, nor was it even set up spiritually or governmentally for that to be a person that he had. 
Have I desired something that God did not promise me? I looked at something, called it a good thing, said God would give me the desires of my heart and slapped the God label on it. Now it hasn't happened and I'm sick. I'm sick. I'm nauseous. I'm upset. I'm uneasy. I'm anxious over something God did not tell me he was going to do. And now I'm upset. Now I'm running around trying to finesse my way into situations that I shouldn't be to get something God did not tell me he was going to give me and that he did not bless. Do you have a restless heart? Am I unforgiving? Do I have unresolved anger in my heart? Unresolved anger and, and unforgiveness, they're like holes in a heart. Peace can't flow through that. Love can't flow through That's that. Right. Mm -hmm. If you have unresolved anger, unresolved um, unforgiveness, you have a restless heart. That's mm -hmm. a symptom of a restless heart. All of those items, all of those things can be cured. Yeah, absolutely. There's, there's such a simple, easy cure. You're Super like, wow, you just kind of like smacked us all in the face. Like, tell me I can fix it. Like, it's not that big of a deal. But you know, it's really interesting because the position of our hearts is very, 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 very important. And one of the things that we see with David is that even when there's a desert around him, there's no desert around his heart. David always alters yes. his worship to, to fit his yes. circumstances perfectly. Right. How do you know? There's over a hundred psalms and not four. Right. David could have written four psalms and then continued saying the same ones over and over again per situation. But here we are. We have over a hundred psalms. You have Proverbs. You have all kinds of things because no matter what was going on, David sat down and wrote a specific kind of worship, a specific kind of praise, a specific kind of celebration, a specific yep. kind of rejoicing to fit his situation. He never took yesterday's praise into tomorrow's battle with him. He never did it. He always positioned his heart every single day. His mercies are anew every morning and so should the position of your heart. Every day you check yourself. You get up. Okay, am I still upset about something that happened yesterday? Make the decision now. If I think about something longer than five minutes, I'm going to deal with it or let it go. You've got to make the decision. There's too much at stake. Too There's much. too much on the line. Too you much. have too much to be excited about. Too much to praise God for. Too much to ask God for. Too many blessings that you haven't seen yet. Too many promises that you're waiting for God to move on. Too many giants to slay. To be worried about something somebody said to you the other day at work. Amen. At the, at the end of Psalm 55, at the end of Psalm 55, it says that David comforts himself in the hope. In the hope. In the hope. Nothing's happened yet. Nothing's happened yet. But he rejoices at the thought. The thought of God coming through. Can you imagine exactly what you're believing God for to be right outside of that door? Mm -hmm. You'd be happy just at the thought. At just the when, thought. right when I said it, you laughed. You got excited. Because the thought made you what? Made you happy. Rejoice at the thought. Be excited about the hope of God coming through. And, and so look, if you're going to rejoice at the thought, the thought has got to come. You've got to focus on the thought. The thought doesn't just pop up in your mind, does it? You've got to focus. So what are some of the, what is the, I should say, what is the antidote? What is, what is the cure for a restless heart? Let's look at Philippians 4. Let's look at Philippians 4, verses 4 through 9. It's really not difficult. Y'all know I am about the word. The word is not hard. No. It is not hard. Philippians 4, verses 4 through 9. I'm going to read it to you in the New American Standard Bible, and then we're going to look at it in the voice. Philippians 4, 4 through 9 says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Yeah. And again I say rejoice. Let your gentle spirit be known to all men. The Lord is near. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence and if anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. The things you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. I'm going to read it to you in the, in the voice. It says, most of all, friends, always rejoice in the Lord. I never tire of saying it. Rejoice. Keep your gentle nature so that all people will know what it looks like to walk in his footsteps. The Lord is ever present with us. Don't be anxious about things. Instead, pray. Pray about everything. He longs to hear your requests. So talk to God about your needs and be thankful for what he has done. And know that the peace of God, a peace that is beyond any and all of our human understanding, will watch over your hearts and minds in Jesus, the Anointed One. Finally, brothers and sisters, fill your minds with beauty and truth. Meditate on whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is good, whatever is virtuous and praiseworthy. Keep to the script. 
Whatever you learned and received and heard and saw in me, do it. And the God of peace will walk with you. You know, as I begin to look at that, I look and I just kind of like uh, extracted seven things. Seven things from that. You want to be cured of, you want to have an antidote for, a restless heart. You got to put your mind somewhere and God tells us exactly where to put it. Right. And so when we look at this scripture, the first thing he says to do is rejoice. Right. That's the first thing. First thing he says to do. As a matter of fact, he doesn't just say rejoice. He says rejoice and again rejoice. He said, if you didn't get it the first time, I'm going to tell you again that you need to rejoice. It's not enough to tell you once because most of us are a little bit slow when it comes to rejoicing. So he says, look, I need you to know, I'm going to tell you two times in a row, rejoice. And again, I say rejoice. I looked at that word rejoice there and it doesn't mean to just have joy again. What it means is to delight in the grace of God. Delight yourself in the grace of God. He says, look, now, now I have to help you understand something. If you're dealing with a restless heart and you're dealing with uh, the, the promise not coming to pass yet, you're dealing with, you know, you know the word. And the word says that God will perfect those things that concern you. Right. You quote that word, you stand on that word, but your heart is still restless sometimes because it hasn't come to pass. The first thing he tells you to do is rejoice. Right. And again, I say rejoice. Do it again. Right. You know, it's like you tell your child something, they do something, and they get upset, you're like, do it again. Right. He's telling us, look, you rejoice, do it again, rejoice again. I need you to focus on, take your mind, and put it on my grace. Amen. Put it on my grace. My heart is getting restless. I'm expecting this to happen. I thought this would happen by 30. Thought it would happen by 40. Thought it would happen, and now I'm 60. I thought this would take a place in my life by now. I thought I would have been further along. No, no, no. No need to fret. Take your mind, take your heart. Take your thoughts and begin to put them on the grace of God. The sufficiency, the all-sufficient, all-knowing power of God. Put it there. That's why I need you to focus yourself. You know, sometimes we allow ourselves to get into these idle places where we don't put our minds where they need to go. We allow our minds to do whatever they want to do. And we have to, none of us in here has got some kind of well-trained mind, like a well-trained dog. You have to determine that you're going to train it. Right. And the way that you train it is right here in Philippians 4. And he's very clear. He says rejoice. And then again, I'm going to tell you to rejoice. Take your mind off of the situation. Put it on the grace of God. Put it on the fact that God's grace is more than enough to handle whatever you need. To show you whatever solution that you need to whatever situation. It's more than enough. Then he says, look, I need you to do something. Not only rejoice in the Lord. And again, I say rejoice. But then he goes on to say, let your gentle spirit be known to all men. The Lord is near. He said, no, I need you to get your attitude right. Right. So number one, you're going to rejoice in the Lord and then again rejoice. I'm going to put my mind in a place where it's focused on the grace of God and what God is going to do. Remember, at the thought, I became excited. At the thought is where I began to really receive the deliverance, to really receive what God had for me. He says, look, I need you to keep your attitude right. I need you to have a gentle spirit. I need you to avoid the harshness and the sarcasm and the bitterness. And I need you to avoid those things that will distract and pull away and take away from my gentleness. He said, I need you during this time to not go off on people. I need you to stop being angry and irritated and frustrated toward people. I need you to not have a bad, bad attitude right now. Bad attitude. That's a new word. I need you to not have a bad attitude right now. I need you to not have a bad attitude right now because I'm trying to do something. He said, I'm trying to teach you how to put your mind where it needs to go so you can position yourself to receive the things that I have for you. Remember, breakthrough comes from God, but it comes through your hand. What is your hand doing? Your hand is taking your brain, setting it on his grace, then getting your attitude straight. Amen. Then he says, look, don't be anxious. Don't be anxious. He says, look, <laughs> he says, now, now that you have put your mind on my grace, now that you're getting your attitude right, now I need to make sure that you're not anxious. You're anxious for nothing. But what's so interesting is I looked at that word anxious. It's not about just not worrying. It's not just not about fretting. What it is is it's not being distracted. He said, now I, think I need you to avoid all distractions. Amen. Anything that would distract you and take away from your focus on my grace right. such that you can position yourself to get and obtain what I have for you, I need you to avoid all distractions. Don't even allow yourself to be distracted. All right. Don't even allow yourself to be distracted. Now, I'm going to tell you something. In the distraction, you have to know and understand that you don't get distracted all by yourself. Yeah. You don't get distracted. Other people are involved in your distraction. Yeah. Always. <laughs> Other people are always just involved in your distraction. So you have to make the decision and the determination that you're going to choose the right group to be around such that they are going in the same flow and not working against you. Yeah. That's what you have to do. Because the Bible is very clear. The Bible says a little leaven 
Just a little bit. I don't know why we think we're so big and bad and strong all the time. The Bible says even a, even a, even a wise man, a strong man can get turned aside by a little hussy, right? So you have to determine, it real, it's the strong ones that the enemy comes afterwards. So after, so you have to understand that, no, look, look, no, no, no. The distraction takes place. You've got to know and understand, okay, you know what? I'm around this group. And if a little leaven, if it's one out of five of them, and you hanging with the few, the six out of five, and it's one of them that's going in a whole different direction, you need to make some decisions. You need to make some decisions. Not only does the Bible say a little leaven, he also says a little foxes. Spoil the He also says that the, 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 those who are wise walk with the wise, and a companion of fools suffers harm. There's so many places in the Word of God where God says you need to check your, your surroundings. You need to check your social relationships. You need to check and understand because, listen, too many times people are in faith. They're believing God for great and mighty things. You got your faith locked down and here comes somebody who's supposed to be your sister or brother in the Lord whispering something in your ear. Now you're all jacked up, turned upside down. You don't know what to do. You're wondering where in the world did this come from? I thought that they were with me. You don't even, in actuality, you don't even realize that they just inserted something into your spirit, man, that caused you to not believe the way you believed before. You have to determine that you're going to change your social friendships and your groups and people that you hang around because you don't have time not to be in faith. You don't have time to be in a situation where you're expecting God to do things. You believe in God to do things and someone leans over to you and says, well, I don't know if you can do it or not. I don't have time for that. 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 The Bible says, how can two walk together unless they agree? And so if I'm going to walk with you as a sister or a brother in the Lord and we're going to have covenant together, there's got to be some agreement going on. Got to be some agreement going on. And so because of that, you have to determine if I'm not walking with people that are in agreement, then I don't need to be walking. Come on now. And I need to determine who are those that I'm in agreement with so I can walk with them and we can walk together. It's very, very important because I'm telling you something. If we're going to get rid of this restless heart, we got to be careful of who we surround ourselves with. Anxious. Don't be anxious. That's just a part of don't be an an not being anxious. Being anxious also means, this is what the word means in Greek, it means to be pulled apart in different directions. Right. He says when people are they're pulled apart in different directions such that they're no longer whole but fragmented. No longer whole but fragmented. See, when your mind starts getting pulled in this way and your mind starts getting pulled in that way and people start to interject these thoughts and then they start to interject these thoughts and then you listen to this song and they're talking about something crazy and then you listen to this song and they're talking about the things of the Lord and you listen to this person on the TV and they're talking about how awesome the economy is and it's going to turn around. Then you listen to this one over here and they said that, you know, Jesus is coming back tomorrow and, you know, you just, you hear all these different things. You have to determine you're not going to allow yourself not to be whole. That you will not be in a position where you're fragmented and you're in your, in your peace. And so when you look at this word here, uh, don't be anxious. He's saying, look, I need you to not have fragmented peace. That's what it is. I need you to not have fragmented peace. The Bible is very clear. God says, look, you know, when Jesus, Jesus said, look, I came here and I came here and I left you my peace. The same peace that Jesus had, he left here for us. He had peace by the Holy Spirit. When he left, he left the Holy Spirit here with us. We have the same exact peace and access to that peace that Jesus had. So there's no reason why we should be giving our peace up. There's no reason why we should be distracted and allow our peace to fly out the window, fly out the door. We need to pursue peace no matter what. We need to get to the point where we guard peace like a guard dog guards a drug, a drug house, right? You know, we need to be so on that where we're like, you know, no, 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 no. Nothing is going to take my peace. My kids know when they were little and they would start fussing, no, 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 we're not doing this. We're not doing this because we have to have peace. You don't understand. I didn't allow them to get in positions where the house is all topsy-turvy. you yelling in the car and acting up. No, 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 no. We pursue peace. And so guess what? There's going to be peace in this place right now. You have to determine that you guard peace to that degree. That means if somebody is whispering something in your ear that is not rooted and grounded in peace, rooted and grounded in truth, rooted and grounded in love, you need to kick that thing to the curb. Period. Period. Why do people act like, you know, I, I don't understand the codependency thing. Come on, teach. Okay, I don't, I, the way the, the codependency thing where it's like, uh, people act like people are Jesus. Mm. There's only one. Yes. There's only one. And so we have to know and understand that, uh, you know, uh, just, like a, a, just like a chemical bond can be broken, a natural covenant can be broken 
if it's necessary. Right. If it's necessary. Why do we act like we can't, we can't sever a relationship? We can't sever a tie. Why is it that you can get divorced? Come on. Come on. You can get divorced. Why can't you end a friendship? Come on, you better teach. You better teach. Right? Why can't you... What, never said that the friendship wouldn't come back again. But why can't you end it? So you can have your peace of mind. So you can have your peace of mind. There are too many people in relationships, in girlfriend, boyfriend relationships, in friendships, where they just can't end it. Do you understand your peace is at stake? When he says be anxious for nothing, he's saying don't let anything come in the way of your peace. And if that situation is bringing you down in any way, if it's not, if it's not uh, walking along with you in the direction that God has for you to go, then it's hindering you in some way. You gotta make sure that you cut that thing off, which means, and which is why the Lord was very, very clear in the word of God where he told who was it? He said, look, you know what? In this, at this point in time, he said, look, you leave this stuff. I'm going to give you houses. I'm going to give you land. I'm going to give you a new mama, a new daddy, a new sister, a new brother, a new aunt, a new cousin. Forget the blood is sticking in the water. No, 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 no. No, the, the spirit is thicker than the blood. The spirit is thicker than the blood. And so some of us need to walk. Some of us need to determine, you know what? You know what? Grandma. You know what, Auntie so and so? I love you dearly. I love you dearly, but for the next six, eight months, I can't talk to you. I love you. I'm praying for you. I'm believing God for you. I will send you a confession and a declaration to let you know that I'm in faith for you. You know what, dear brother? You know what, dear sister? You know what, Auntie, Uncle? You know, you know we act like we're codependent. We are not enslaved to people. We are not enslaved to people. We're not enslaved to people. If you need to cut, what did Bishop say? Cut and run. Cut and run. Cut and run. What'd you say? I said run. Run. Right. Don't just cut. Run. Because you know if you cut and hang out, you, you reconnect yourself somehow. And so you have to know and understand. So I'm number four. Number four, he says, look. You rejoice. You put your, 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 you put your mindset, you put yourself in the framework of saying, hey, the grace of God is sufficient. You keep your attitude right. You get your attitude right. Then you make sure that you are not fragmented. You're not anxious. You're not distracted. You know, you get your social groups and your people groups right to make sure that everybody's going in the same direction. You pray and you talk to God. You pray and you talk to God. That's number four. Let there be an exchange between you and him. Let there be prayer. Let there be supplication, petitioning for the things you need. But then number five, you've got to cultivate a consistent thankfulness. Consistent thankfulness. So, you know, like, uh, like Pastor Chloe said, if you believe that there was right outside that door, what God had for you is there, you will begin to thank him now for what you have not seen. And so he said, look, I need you to understand, you focus first on the fact that God's grace is enough, it's sufficient. You get your attitude right. You cut off the distractions. After you cut off the distractions and you say, you know what, I thank you, Lord God, for what I've yet to see. I thank you, Lord God, that even though that thing has not happened yet, I believe that not only you're the author and the finisher of my faith, but I also believe that you perfect those things that concern me. You begin to focus yourself on giving him thanks. Thank him for it. Give him glory for it as if it's right in your midst. Remember, at the thought. At the thought. The deliverance comes at the thought. So at the thought, you begin, to, you begin to thank God and you begin to praise God and give Him a consistent thankfulness. Number six, you begin to meditate. He says, now, after you've done those things, now I need you to take your mind and I need you to put it on things that are lovely and praiseworthy and of good report. I need you to put your mind on these things. Your mind can't stay on stuff that's not praiseworthy. It can't stay on stuff that's not of good report. It can't stay on things that it used to be on before. It can't listen to the same old music it used to listen to before. I can't talk to the same old people that he used to talk to before. I need you to put your mind on things that are lovely right. and praiseworthy right. and of good report. Now, people are going to make fun of you for that. Right. People are going to talk to you, talk about you for that. They're going to say, oh, you're just pie in the sky, or you just have blind faith, or you just, no, no, no. What you have is, the Bible says, according to your faith, be it unto you. They can talk all they want, but I'm going to get what God has for me. I'm going to get what God has for me. So because of that, I'm going to keep my mind focused, my mouth focused, and I'm going to believe God. I'm going to speak what I believe. And so I'm going I'm to make sure that I meditate and dwell on 
things that are lovely and praiseworthy, good report. So the bad thought comes into the mind. I take that thought captive in the name of Jesus. It exalted itself against the knowledge of what God has shown me and taught me. So I am not going to hold on to that thought. I'm not going to proliferate on that thought. That thought is not going to become a revelation to me. I'm not going to bring that thought into existence in my life. But instead, I'm going to take that thought. I'm going to hold it captive. You know, when, when Josh was a baby, you know, and of course being the first son, uh, first child, you know, he was a baby. And you know, when you have your first baby, a lot of people who you don't ask, reach out to go hold your baby. Okay, come here, Shauna. And so my sister and I had babies around the same time. And so, you know, I would be the pretend like you come to get the baby. Uh, that's what I used to do. That's what I used to do. They would go like this, I'm coming, uh, I would grab their arm. Bishop said, what are you doing? So I'm grabbing their arm, you don't touch it on my baby. My baby is not public property. And it will not be passed around from person to person to person to person to person. That's a real human being that I'm growing and developing and training and teaching and I don't need whatever spirits on you on them. So, it will not be passed around like a... Some people smoke. That's all I'm gonna say. So, because of that, you need to know what saying. Just like I took that arm captive, you take that thought captive. You take that thought captive. You don't allow the thought, as soon as it comes, shut it down. Shut it down. Shut it down as soon as it comes. As soon as it comes, shut it down. It doesn't belong there. It has just violated your mind. It has violated your life. You need to understand when the thoughts come like that, you need to say, whoa, that's a violation. That's a violation. You are entering territory that does not belong to you. And so you need to stop letting thoughts be in your mind. You need to begin to take them captive and understand that these are, things, these are violations. They do not have a spiritual authority to stay where they have tried to go. Shut it down. And lastly, you got to keep to the scripts. Keep to the scripts so that the peace of God will walk with you, dwell with you all the days of your life. You've got to keep the peace of God active in your life. So I want you to stand to your feet. I want you to get out that, that phone, get out that piece of paper, whatever it is that uh, Pastor Chloe had you write down, that thing that you were believing God for, the, believe, the thing you were believing God to manifest, that thing that has not yet manifested, but you are in faith that he's going to perfect those things that concern you. I want you to pull it out and we're going to just take a look at it for a minute. Let's take a look at it for a minute. Because he's going to do it. Amen. Don't get restless. Yeah. Go ahead. He's going to do it. I need you to not get restless. Amen. I need you to do what we said. The moment your mind stops, starts drifting, you're going to rejoice in the Lord. And then again rejoice. That means don't just do it one time and say, I did it over and over and over and over again. You're going to focus your mind on the fact that God's grace is sufficient. Then you're going to keep your attitude right. Yeah. You're not going to walk around angry and mad at people, getting short with people, getting smart out with people, getting bitter with people, getting resentful toward people because it hasn't happened yet. Yeah. Then you're going to make sure that you're not anxious. You're not going to allow yourself to be distracted. Yeah. You're going to watch who you're around so you can stay focused. The Bible is very clear. It says, look, a man that is given to war, he doesn't entangle himself in so civilian affairs. Hanging out. No, no, no. He is so focused on the battle. He's so focused on the task at hand. He doesn't mingle with things around that everyone else is doing. You got to get that disciplined and that regimented in your faith. That if anything that's not going in the direction you're going in, that's on the, that's on the side right now. Because you're focused. You're going to pray to God. You're going to talk to him. Of course the enemy's going to try again. But that's when you're going to set your mind on things above. You're going to meditate on things that are lovely and praiseworthy and of good report. You're going to consistently thank God, even though it hasn't happened yet. And then you're going to begin to meditate and begin to thank God so that the peace of God will be with you as you believe in God for him to bring this to pass. I want you to pray over this, this thing here and just repeat after me. Say, Father, in Jesus' name. We give you honor and glory for who you are in our lives. You are our way maker, our miracle worker. And we declare from this day forward, we will see the unfinished thing finished. Say it again. Say, we will 
see the unfinished thing finished. We will not fret. We will not fear. But we'll remain confident that you will complete what you have started. Our minds and our hearts are set in you. Our hope is in you. And your peace will keep our hearts and our minds in perfect peace. In Jesus' name, amen. And amen. Give God a great big hand clap of praise. eyes closed and everyone's head bowed. We want to give you the opportunity today. If you have not received Jesus as your Lord and Savior and the Lord God has been tugging on your heart, pulling on your heart, whether it was in here or whether it was before you got here, maybe even throughout this week, maybe even throughout this month, we want to give you an opportunity today to make Jesus your Lord. You know, we talked about moving beyond where you are and we talked about um, the significance of having the re restless heart and how to get the anecdote for the restless heart. But I'm going to tell you, you will never have a heart at rest until you have Jesus. Until you have him in your life, moving and active. Amen. Being your father, giving you direction, loving on you. Amen. That's what he came here for. So right now, I want to give you an opportunity. Those of you who've never received Jesus as your Lord and Savior before, or you have, and hey, you say, you know what? I want to deepen my walk with him. I want to rededicate my life to him. I want to have a better connection because I've kind of been disconnected. I've been living that fragmented lifestyle. I've kind of been doing my own thing. And you want to reconnect and rededicate yourself. Amen. We want to give you that opportunity today. Just today. Today. I want to let you know that um, God is such an awesome God. And he knows right where you are. You don't have to get perfect to come to him. He just wants you to simply come to him. And he will make you exactly who he wants to make you. So again, while every believer is praying, if that's you, you say, Pastor Cherise, Pastor Chloe, hey, servant leadership team, I want everyone to know, I have not received Jesus as my Lord and Savior, but I want to. I'm not going to ask you to come forward just yet. I'm just going to ask you to raise your hand wherever you're standing and keep it raised so we can recognize you. And we're going to pray a prayer together of salvation and rededication. Or if you want to rededicate your life. And you're serious about it this time. Maybe you weren't serious before. I want you to raise your hand and we'll recognize you and pray a prayer of salvation and rededication with you as well. So if that's you, if you raise your hand, we'll recognize you. Amen. And we'll pray a prayer together. Amen. Amen. I believe it's mostly family today. Final altar call is this. And we're going to pray a prayer anyway of salvation and rededication for those who are here, uh, who are watching, and will watch. Amen. Those of you who have never received the gift of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues, um, you know, it's an awesome gift. It's a gift after you receive Jesus into your life. The Bible says, you know, we celebrate Pentecost Sunday, but the Bible says that when Jesus left, and he left his Holy Spirit here, that there's a language that he gives us. And it's the language by, by which we communicate with God. Amen. That causes us to be strong in our inner man, our spirit. It's a language that we don't know that God teaches us. It doesn't have to be weird or strange. We believe God and God is the one who brings the increase. And so right now, if you've not received the gift of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues, or you want to, I want you to raise your hand wherever you are. Some of you may have received and hey, maybe the language has gotten a little bit sluggish because you've not prayed in the Spirit for a long time and so you kind of need a refreshing. You can answer that call as well. So again, if there's anyone here, you need to raise your hand, you want to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues, or you want a refreshing in the gift, raise your hand as well. And we'll make sure that we have uh, the appropriate people at the altar to pray with you if there's anyone here. Amen. I'm going to ask some of the deacons to go ahead and make their way to the altar. Amen. If you, in your heart, are answering any one of those calls, I want you to make your way, when we dismiss, to the altar. Amen. Let them know your need. and Let them know what you believe, what you believe in God for and you want them to pray a prayer of agreement with. And they will pray with you. Amen. Amen. Let's just pray this prayer together. Say, Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for your son Jesus who died on the cross for my sins. I thank you, Lord, for raising him up in power so that I could live the abundant life. Jesus, come into my heart. Be my Lord and my Savior. From this day forward, I belong to you. 
In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Give God a great big hand clap of praise.